Hello, good afternoon. Um, unfortunately, this is not with uh, bigger letters, so I, I have to put my, my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. No, come on, I'm kidding, of course. So, uh, welcome to this uh, first open consultation on the WISIS Plus 20. Uh, I don't think that uh, a lot of people here in, uh, in this uh, IGF, they know that this is the first open consultation for the future of, uh, of the WISIS. But uh, nevertheless, we are doing that during the IGF. And uh, I'm sure that we uh, will get more involvement for uh, the different stakeholders uh, throughout the uh, next two years. So, Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. A warmest welcome to the launch of the open consultation of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development at the CSTD. On the WISIS Plus 20 review, as an hybrid uh, open forum event on the Internet Governance Forum 2023. So I am Anna Cristina Neves and I'm chair of the CSTD. And today I'm moderating this event uh, entitled WISIS at 20 Successes, Failures and Future Expectations, a partnership between uh, the CSTD, the ITU, UNESCO and UNDEP, all key actors of the WISIS. As you know, the WISIS vision is to establish, and now I'm going to quote uh, some Geneva Action Plan uh, text, um, people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information society for harnessing the potential of information and communication technologies for sustainable development. So we have different questions. To what extent and how has the vision of a people-centered, inclusive and development-oriented information society evolved over the past 20 years since WISIS? We are still nowadays talking about people-centered, human-centric, uh, uh, inclusiveness and uh, development. Uh, in 2003, we're talking about information society. Nowadays, we are talking about uh, digital, we have to understand what we mean by that, but we know that from uh, uh, the Tunis Agenda of two, 2005, where this uh, Internet Governance Forum uh, was set up, and we, were, we had all these uh, uh, problems already, and uh, diagnosis, and we were trying to make uh, the world uh, a better place to live. How will ongoing trends and emerging technologies, nowadays particularly um, artificial intelligence, but we have so many other uh, emerging technologies as quantum technologies, this, the, the 3D printing, etc. So um, how will ongoing trends and emerging technologies impact progress towards human development and the sustainable development goals? Moreover, how can these trends enable or hinder the realization of the WISIS vision? What measures should be taken to advance international cooperation, including in terms of governance to leverage emerging technologies for sustainable development in economic, social, environmental, and cultural dim dimensions? These are some of the questions uh, that we invite you to consider today. If I put them simply, the questions could be how much progress uh, have we made towards that vision? What challenges uh, remain in the way ahead? Those are also issues that CSTD has been addressing in implementation um, of its ECOSOC and the General Assembly mandate to review the implementation of the WISIS outcomes, including through annual reports to the ECOSOC and the General Assembly, and the contribution of input to the WISIS Plus 10 review back uh, uh, to the General Assembly in 2015. And uh, as some of you may remember, the General Assembly uh, adopted a resolution on the 16th December 2015, uh, and in that uh, resolution called for a high-level meeting to be held in 2025 to review the overall implementation of the outcomes of the World Summit on Information Society, known as WISIS Plus 20 Review. 
For the WISIS Plus 20 review, the ECOSOC, so the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, adopted a resolution in June 2023 uh, that requests the CSTD to collect inputs from member states, all facilitators and other stakeholders to, and to organize during its upcoming session uh, in 2024, March 2024, and in its 28th session the year uh, uh, after, in 2025, substantive discussions on the progress made in the implementation of the outcomes of the WISIS during the past 20 years, and to report thereon through the ECOSOC, then to the General Assembly. The CSTD members adopted a roadmap at its annual session last March 2023 to guide the CSTD's work on WISIS plus 10, uh, sorry, 20 review. Uh, here is a snapshot of the roadmap. So you can uh, see the roadmap. And uh, thanks, Eva, for sharing the slide. So you can see on that slide that March 2023, uh, um, the CSTDs, uh, so it was uh, determined that CSTDs uh, has a major role on the WISIS Plus 20 review and that uh, the CSED has uh, to, to produce a synthesis report, which first draft will be presented to the CSTD in March 2024, and the final draft will be presented on the 28th CSTD in 2025. The CSTD outcomes uh, will be submitted via ECOSOC to the General Assembly's with this review in 2025. So this is uh, uh, open consultation uh, that will be held at national, regional, and international level uh, with multilateral agencies, private sector, technical community, national governments, civil society, academia. So we have these two, uh, two years ahead of us until um, a resolution will be adopted in, uh, in UNGA the United Nations um, General Assembly 2020, in, in 2025. I wish to underline that the WISIS Plus 20 review at CSTD will take a progressive and a perspective or forward-looking approach uh, by not only looking at the present, but more importantly, looking to the future equally. I want to emphasize that an integral part of the CSTD's WISIS Plus 20 review is the engagement of all stakeholders in open consultations and in the survey questionnaire that the CSTD Secretariat will conduct from late 2023 until late 2024. The CSTD is grateful to the Internet Governance Forum for giving a space to the CSTD to launch its open multi-stakeholder consultation uh, at the 18th IGF in this uh, uh, ancient and beautiful city of Kyoto. Internet governance is a, an important component of the WISIS process, and of course, the IGF itself is an outcome of WISIS. But it's important to remember that the WISIS process covers all aspects of digitalization including the issues concerned with aspects of development and the environment that are discussed in the WISIS Forum and elsewhere. The objective of today's event is to enable a candid and open dialogue, drawing on the collective wisdom, perspectives, and experiences of the various stakeholders. The insights and recommendations stemming from today's interactions will undoubtedly contribute to the synthesis report to the WIP prepared by the CSTD Secretariat, which is intending to shape substantive discussions at the CSTD's WISIS Plus 20 review sessions as mandated by ECOSOC. Our session is structured as follows. Ms. Shemika uh, Siriman, uh, head of the CSTD Secretariat and the Director of Division on Technology and uh, Logistics, UNCTAD, will make opening remarks. And uh, Mr. Ueno, uh, on, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Yoshi Lira, 
Deputy Director General for G7, uh, G20 Relations, Government of Japan, will deliver a keynote speech. Uh, he uh, will be followed by six discussant starters who will share with us their views and insights. Thereafter, I will open the floor to both in-person attendees and remote participants for a freestyle roundtable discussions under my moderation, including judicious time management. Uh, so, um, I would like to remind remote participants that they should request the floor through the hand raising feature on the Zoom platform. Ladies and gentlemen, now it is my great pleasure to invite Ms. Shamika Siriman, Director of the Division on Technology and Logistics of UNCTAD and Head of the CSCD Secretariat, to make opening remarks. Mrs. Siriman, the floor is yours. Good afternoon uh, and good morning and good evening to uh, all of you joining from uh, online. So let me uh, take the opportunity to join the chair of the CSTD uh, in welcoming you to this CSTD open consultation on the VCIS Plus 20 review. And I think we all agree that the VCIS vision of a people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information so society remains as valid as ever and also quite unfulfilled. So the journey has not ended. And in fact, it is quite concerned. We have uh, enormous of our concerns when we know that the 95% of the world's population live today within range of a mobile broadband network. In LDCs, just 36% of their people are connected and these are concerns and women are, remain digitally marginalized in many of the world's poorer countries, and the, you know, there's a massive rural-urban divides, and there are many multifaceted divides. And I think we, all, we also have seen that these divides have become quite serious development divide. It's not just a, it's not no longer a digital divide. It's has transformed into a development divide, and we experienced that during COVID-19 times those who has access to internet and manage to live and manage to work and manage to have education online and buy stuff online, and those who were not connected basically were locked out of, you know, of, of the functioning world, and that's a concern. So as our CSTD chair, Anna, as you said, that today the CSTD is opening a consultation process, and we want your input about the lessons of the 20 years of VCIS implementation. And from that lessons, we also need to understand from your own viewpoints, how, do we, how are we going to navigate this emerging world? You know, we are going through a massive digital technological revolution, and this is probably the technological revolution of our lifetimes. And, uh, and so how do we, we are walking into uncharted territory as we have heard in many, many, many rooms of, uh, in, in the IGF. So we want to hear from you about the new themes, the threats, the opportunities that need responses from the UN system. We also ask you as WISI stakeholders, and you ushered WISI, to tell us about ways to ensure that the WISI process contributes to to preserving and improving multilateral cooperation in the digital sphere. I want to also want to say that this, as the CSTD Secretariat, we are working very closely with other key WISIS players and our great partners like the ITU, UNESCO, UNDP, and the regional commissions in this review. And uh, I am very happy to have all of us coming together because we will all do our own consultations because we all have our own lines, uh, action lines, but we will all merge, we will all use that inputs into the VCIS process as we prepare the material for the General Assembly. So I am very happy to let you know that this is done with the one UN kind of approach. And I'm also very happy to say, as Anna said earlier, this is truly a multi-stakeholder consultation. 
and that's what we need. We need, we cannot, it's not just the governments can navigate these emerging worlds, it's not just the international organizations, the academia, it's the civil society, the private sector, you know, they, we all need to be at the table and we all need to put our voices. So here I like to now showcase the, 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 the timeline of the various WISIS processes over the years showing the different agencies' contribution. Maybe you may not be able to see it very well, but we will share with this uh, document with you because it shows the processes that's going towards, you know, how are we gonna all converge? So we will not walk on parallel roads. And I also want to emphasize this example of this interagency collaboration. We have jointly circulated a questionnaire to st seek stakeholder inputs for the VCS Plus 20 review. And please help us circulate it among your networks. And it is extremely important that we get proper data. Otherwise, it's all going to be anecdotal, you know, somebody said this and somebody said that. So we really are looking to collect data and, and have a report which is fact-based. So please help us. I think we spend a lot of time. You know, it's, it's a simple questionnaire, but we spell, uh, spend time to make sure that we get good data. So please also do that. So let me end here, and I look forward to a productive discussion. And just as Anna said, this is just the beginning. We will work with our regional commissions. We will have regional consultations, and we will have consultations wherever you open us a, a room for. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Siriman, for your very uh, insightful and interesting uh, remarks, uh, reflections on uh, WISIS. And uh, I, I use this opportunity uh, to uh, to uh, for everyone to read or to revisit uh, the Geneva uh, principles, the Geneva Action Plan, and the Tunisia Agenda. Maybe it's good for everybody to reread these uh, documents um, because um, from three days of uh, IGF, it seems like uh, uh, some of us uh, never wrote, uh, ne ne never uh, read those documents. And now that we are uh, discussing uh, WISIS plus 20, it's very important to have that, those in mind. Now I'm pleased to invite uh, Mr. Weno uh, that will uh, read the keynote speech on behalf of Mr. Yoichi Ida, Deputy Director General for G7 uh, G20 Relations, Government of J uh, Japan, so to deliver uh, Mr. Ida's keynote speech, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yasunari Ueno from Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Japan. My boss, Mr. Ida, was planning to deliver a keynote speech here, but he could not attend this session because of urgent business. So please allow me to deliver his speech on behalf of him. Firstly, I would like to say welcome to Kyoto, welcome to IGF 2020. 23, I appreciated both physical participants and the remote participants. I heard the number of registration for IGF Kyoto is now over 8,000. We, as host country, is very glad with this figure. Also, this number show how important IGF is. Government of Japan has strongly committed marriage holder uh, multi-stakeholder approach for internet governance. In this IGF, it is important to respect the efforts of the past 17 times of this event and to build on new efforts. From this perspective, we actively participate in leadership panels. We have contributed from the standpoints of the host country. As the concept note of this session points out, the current digital society has greatly changed since 2005, but the idea of a people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information society has not changed. For this purpose, a free, 
open and global internet is important. In this context, we should continue making our effort to be bring about socio-economic development so that no one left behind from human-centered innovation. Also, to enhance the re reliability of internet, it is important to address the issue of mis disinformation and cybersecurity. It is also important for the international community to develop digital infrastructure and address the issue of digital divide. The idea people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information society is the same for AI governance, which is current important issue of, for international society. Currently, the government of Japan, as the G7 presidency, is leading discussion on AI governance through a process named as Hiroshima AI process. We are planning to advance this Hiroshima AI process in cooperation with the United <laughs> Nations. With the WSIS Plus 20 review coming up in 2025, I believe the IGF Kyoto this year is a very important opportunity. We are looking forward to sharing and uh, exchanging opinions and ideas between various stakeholders. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ueno, uh, very much for sharing Mr. Mr. Ida's deep thoughts and uh, for setting the scene uh, of our discussions today. And congratulations for uh, the 8,000 registrations. That is huge. Nobody can, can say that it's not huge and powerful. Wow. Congratulations again. So next, I will invite uh, the five discussion starters to share their views and insights with us. Uh, each speaker has uh, four or five minutes at most, and then uh, it will be uh, open for, for everyone in this room, to, uh, in this room and online, of course, uh, to, to make a statement or to say whatever they want. Uh, so I will start with uh, Miss Isabel uh, Lois. Loa? Lois. Ah, oh, yes, the Spanish family. <laughs> Uh, senior Policy Advisor uh, at the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. So uh, I think that you are going to uh, reply to a question uh, which is what needs to be done in international cooperation for a better achievement of the WISIS vision. Isn't that right? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So. It's been two decades since the first World Summit on Information Society took place in Geneva. And I would like to start with acknowledging the tremendous progress that has been achieved since then. I mean, inclusive, transparent, and multi-stakeholder processes have proven to be essential in addressing the complex issues of digital governance. And we have learned that cooperation, exchange of information, and joint identification of the relevant cross-sectorial issues are key um, in this process, as well as fostering strong partnerships between all the stakeholders. Building trust between stakeholders and taking action against prejudicial is crucial. As we look forward to the future and the is Plus 20 review, our task and the task is clear. We need to strengthen the process that empowers individuals, regardless of their gender, age, or origin. We need to center the governance of emerging technologies that lead to a sustainable development in economic, social, and environmental dimension. As a government representative, I have to remind myself and my fellow counterparts that by actively listening and taking into account the needs and knowledge of the civil society, private sector, technical communities, academia, and more, we can create an inclusive environment that thrives on constructive criticism and uses the experience that we may not have. And that is what I've been seeing in the past IGFs and here again in this successful Kyoto edition. The VISIS has been one of the most inclusive processes to date and the outcome reflects it. There is the sense of community and a commitment of all that are involved that demonstrates the power of the democratic multi-stakeholder participation. However, we must ensure that this participation remains 
consistent, inclusive, and representative of all regions of the world. For instance, the CSTD could seek synergies with the wide and rich network of national and regional IGF initiatives, as it was mentioned before. And whilst we made significant progress, challenges still lie ahead. Two decades ago, only 6% of the world population had access to the internet. Today, that number stands at about 70%, and the principles laid down in 2003 remain valid, especially regarding the multi-stakeholder approach. But we must build upon the knowledge and experience we have gained since, and focus on connecting the remaining 2.6 billion individuals who are still disconnected, and then ensuring that the connection is meaningful and then effectively govern together based on those common principles. This can only be achieved through collaboration and inclusion. The Visis Plus 20 review comes at a particular time as AI and its governance is at the forefront of many minds. In this process, it is essential to adapt as well a gender lens. Women's voices and perspective must be included and valued in all aspects of internet governance. By doing so, it will create a human-centered, free and secure digital world that benefits everyone. This is the perspective that many organizations have now been taking very seriously. And just as an example, we can take the ITU or UNESCO, and we should do so as well within the CSTD process and the Visis Plus 20 review. Switzerland firmly believes that inclusive multi-stakeholder and cross-silos cooperation are prerequisites for achieving our vision of a digital world that prioritizes humanity, freedom, security, and inclusivity. Let us continue to work together, breaking down the silos, and ensuring that the benefits of the internet are accessible to all. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Isabel Lois. Uh, uh, the next, um, the next uh, discussant will be Mr. Kamel uh, Sadoui, uh, Chief of Minister's Office, uh, of Ministry of Communication Technologies from Tunisia. And uh, uh, is online, right? Yes. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and from so Tunisia. I think that you are going to talk a little bit about the, um, to regard in the, the, the international uh, multi-stakeholder discussion, how uh, has uh, the international multi-stakeholder evolved since WISIS, and uh, more importantly, how should it evolve in future? Mr. Kamel Sadoui, I will give you four or five minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning from Tunis. It's uh, 7.30 in the morning. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and participants, uh, I'm honored to be with you today in this panel about successes and challenges of 20-year journey of the WISIS. Tunis has the privilege to be linked to this summit through its report, referred to as Tunis Agenda and Outcomes. And, uh, some of you remember that IGF itself is an outcome of the, of the WISIS 2005. Even if this WSS 2005 took place before the boom of social media platforms, artificial intelligence, clouds, and blockchains, its recommendation remain relevant, promoting an open, resilient, unfragmented, and inclusive internet, endorsing human rights and cultural diversity. Tunisia recognizes that institutions such as ICANN uh, and IQ have gone through many improvements since 2005 by supporting international domain names, and allowing for more transparency and accountability, even if the government's participation in ICANN remains at an advisory level, but that can be further improved and put to have a meaningful impact. Today, emerging issues force themselves high items in the agenda, more than the mere technical aspects, such as artificial intelligence implications, protecting people's privacy and personal data when using over-the-top services and social media. Developing countries cannot deal with major platform providers on an equal to equal ground when it comes to taxation, for example, or imposing local rules for personal data protection. For that reason, Tunisia proposes to reconsider the framework of enhanced cooperation. We're not suggesting bringing back the sterile debate on the government's taking over the regulation of internet because the agility of private sector, civil society and experts community is needed to keep leading internet to new horizons. 
What we're recommending is simply the following. The multi-stakeholder approach in internet governance remains the most appropriate. We should keep seeking to implement equal footing and meaningful participation. ICANN, ITU, and other technical bodies have played major role in their respective responsibilities to ensure a stable internet. They should be supported for a resilient and unfragmented internet for all. We're facing more complicated challenges than the mere technical coordination. IGF today is more relevant to share outcomes of the multiple forums and institutions involved in internet governance and needs to secure financing for bigger role and better outcomes. Enhanced cooperation led by CSTD can be useful to tackle emerging issues involving nations, such as managing cyber threats, cyber terrorism, the misuse of internet for money laundering, and the human trafficking. Other inter international institutions involved in internet issues, such as WIPO, WTO, UNESCO, and others, each in its area of competencies and expertise, must further develop multi-stakeholder approach including open consultations and transparent reporting. And finally, each country should watch out for the potential digital gap between regions and social groups, since local digital problems have to be managed locally. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and now I will give the floor to Ms. Anita uh, Gurumurti, uh, founding member and executive uh, director of IT for Change India. And uh, uh, I think that um, you are going uh, uh, to uh, give some remarks of given the wide spreading of digitalization into almost all aspects of our life. How should WISIS be seen and what international cooperation should be shaped? Please, Anita. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, as we move towards the business plus 20 mark, I think digital public policy issues we all acknowledge have expanded infinitely. Some of us here will recall that the WISIS Geneva principle, one of those principles in 2003, held an optimism, and I quote, we are firmly convinced that we are collectively entering a new era of enormous potential, it said. The problem today is that this promise of collective potential is broken. The AI moment is similar in many ways and not so similar to the Gutenberg moment in the 14th century when Gutenberg's letterpress printing revolutionized the world of information and knowledge. AI is moving us to a society of archiving like the printing press did, but unlike Gutenberg's technology, the algorithms that order society today are indiscernible to the public. The printing press shifted power into the hands of private forces, taking it away from the state and destabilizing the authority of the church. Today, the force field of knowledge is similarly controlled by corporations who seek servitude in exchange for data and in information. Our connections are growing as they did in the age of enlightenment, but algorithmic society is also a society of fragmentation. As much as the press led to suffragette movements, and in my own country, a struggle against coloniality, it also led to competing visions of the good and to bloodshed. So also the geopolitical risks of AI for war and annihilation cannot be wished away. The digital is indeed a lever of power and it is no accident that those who control these technologies have little incentive to change the status quo. The WISIS did call out the respective roles of governments in public policy unequivocally including the need to advance international cooperation, especially for the governance of digital technologies. The starting point is to recognize what ails the cooperation. And I would like to highlight in particular the neo-colonial dynamics of the data and AI economy that demand our immediate attention at this point at the business review. The first is that trade forums are often used quite wrongly by the more powerful countries to frame rules for cross-border flows of data. We need a separate space, a separate forum for the negotiations around uh, data governance globally. Secondly, data for development initiatives tend to be extractive. They open up individuals to pan-spectronic surveillance, normalizing dependencies of public systems on extractive private firms. Thirdly, intellectual property regimes have been weaponized by big tech 
And given the prohibitive licensing costs and other barriers to entry, including patents owned by big tech firms, uh, the Global South firms find it an uphill task to scale up and leverage a market share. Big tech firms also often resort to preemptive patenting to retain their competitive advantage, stifling innovation and stifling development of domestic industry. Fourthly, the overemphasis on personal data protection at the cost of market regulation has proven to be detrimental. This means that large tech companies typically owned and primarily operated by white men are extracting data from uninformed users and controlling that data to profit via predictive analytics. Unfortunately, strong data protection laws will not prevent this domination. Fifthly, the silence around development financing is very, very loud. In fact, yesterday, the New York Times has carried an article by African leaders on why debt, African debt, needs to be written off. The odds are stacked against developing countries as pathways to digital sovereignty are really uphill. Recent shocks owing to COVID-19 has, has broken supply chains. Inflation is pushing many global South nations to the verge of crises. So finally, I think that there, are four, there is a four-pronged strategy that is needed in digital cooperation. Firstly, we need to initiate consensus for a global digital human rights constitutionalism that is not only liberal, but that is supra-liberal. Incisive enough to cut through the systemic injustices in the international economic order. Secondly, we effectively need to govern global data public goods and it may be useful to consider rules for varying contributions from varying groups of actors, such as, for instance, through principles like common but differentiated responsibilities explored in various other international negotiations. Thirdly, we need to urgently mobilize public financing to galvanize digital innovation ecosystems. We often talk about digital public goods, but we don't talk enough about public digital financing. I think we need to uh, set that right. And the digital development tax mechanism proposed by the UN Secretary General is particularly relevant in this regard. And fourthly and finally, I think it's still important, although it seems far away in our memories, to still meaningfully internationalize internet governance. It's imperative that the internet as a global commons is governed democratically, and so we need a new arrangement to oversee the technical governance of the internet, an issue that was dropped from the policy table at the WSIS moment, but is indeed long overdue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anita Gurumuthi, uh, for your uh, interesting remarks. And now I give the floor to Mrs. Uh, Ariete uh, Estruizen, Senior Advisor on Global and Regional Internet Governance uh, Association for Progressive Communication South Africa. So, Ariet, to what uh, extent the situation today can be improved for better participation of civil society in the future of WISIS process? The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, and thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I think that, you know, I'd like to respond both at the level of process and also at the level of substance. But first I want to say that we should recognize how powerful WISIS has been in terms of facilitating um, civil society participation. Um, and if you read, Anna talked at, in her opening remarks about reading the WISIS outcome documents. I read them all the time, actually. And I read other UN outcome documents. There's something very unique about the WISIS outcome documents. I, I think the fact that they are the outcome of con contestation between member states, normal to have that in UN processes. But, uh, but um, contestation and collaboration that was mediated by non-state actor participation and texts and views uh, submitted by, by non-state actors. We weren't always in the room, but if we were not in the room, we were at the back of the room. Um, and we were in the caucusing in the corridors, and we submitted our own content and our own statements. And I think that even though civil society and business and other stakeholder groups had their own outcome documents, um, our views 
are reflected in that. So that's one thing, the process. I think secondly, the fact that WISIS is granular, that it has the Geneva principles which are broad-based, which highlight, which are people-centered, not tech-centered, which I feel many of our current documents, the roadmap on digital cooperation, the global digital compact, um, to me, the WUSSES documents speak much more powerfully as somebody who believes in social justice and equity from the global south. It's about people-centered development. Um, and it has human rights, the importance of human rights. It mentions open innovation and open source. When do you get that? You know, it, it's, but it, so it has those broad uh, overarching principles and the emphasis on governments having to play a role in creating an enabling environment. But then it's also granular. It addresses some of the issues that are fundamental to having inclusive societies and effective accountable governance. It talks about education. It talks about food security through the agriculture action line, mm -hmm. media freedom. Um, and if you look at all the action lines, they all are very relevant. And then the action line on enabling environment talks about security and trust. So I think it actually frames, um, and perhaps it's because it was not about the internet, it was about ICTs, um, that it's given it a longevity. I think that remains relevant. But it also means that it allowed space for advocacy groups that are working on social justice issues, that are working on trade justice issues, um, financing, as Anita just mentioned, but it also creates space for people that are working on small-scale agriculture, um, on, on, on bringing education to people so. in remote areas who don't have access um, via technology. Um, in, in a sense, I think many of the responses that helped us cope with the, w, with the, the COVID crisis, that was ground that was laid by, by WISIS uh, approaches and implementation. So I think that, um, so to go forward, I would say let's build on that. Let's continue to have spaces in the WISIS process that has a, um, an opportunity for civil society to be not just consulted, but to actually shape the debate at some of the macro issues, the issues Anita just men mentioned, the issues of financing. I think public financing is one of the failures, the lack of sufficient uh, public financing. That debate's on the table again now because we're talking about digital public infrastructure. Can we look at that from the lessons of, of, of WISIS? And it also still has those specific subject areas. So I think the important is to make the process inclus inclusive, not just consultation, but real collaborative shaping, both at the, the, the sort of broader advocacy um, level, but also at the, at the grassroots level, where civil society the only way in which you actually achieve change is when um, community organizations um, have the power to have their own connectivity, to collaborate with small businesses, to work with local government. You know, that's where you actually have change on the ground. And I think WISIS creates the space for civil society to be involved um, at all those levels. I definitely think that the IGF needs to be strengthened, and so has the WISIS Forum. And I think that the tension sometimes between the two processes being so different, the one being more global south and the other one maybe being a little bit glo global north, I think that's a productive tension. So, so let's, let's, let's work with that, let's build on that. And, um, and then I think the final point on civil society collaboration also relates to the UN system. I think the UN system has its own diversity. Um, it has relationships with different types of civil society organizations who work in different disciplines and different areas. Um, I'm sure they can all be strengthened uh, in terms of their inclusivity, but, but better collaboration within the UN system will also facilitate better collaboration and involvement of civil society. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ariad. I know that you read the, both documents and you were so much involved. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, and from your intervention, of course, we will uh, acknowledge that you really uh, read them and you were part of the process. Uh, so it's very good to 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 have you here uh, and uh, <clears throat> to to refresh uh, some memories. It's very good. Thank you. Now I will give the floor to Ms. Tamilat Adalakum. Where is she? Ah, yeah. So you will speak uh, under two different hats. So uh, 
Temilat is the youth ambassador of the Internet Society, and uh, she is also associate product marketing manager uh, of Google Subsar Africa. So, Temilat, you are going to respond to two questions because of your two hats. So, from the youth perspective, as youth ambassador, what do, you, do youth want from the WISIS process? And secondly, uh, from the private sector perspective as Google manager, how can ongoing trends and emerging technologies, particularly uh, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence, enable or hinder the realization of the WISIS vision? Thank okay. you so much, Anna. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world. And standing on the existing protocol, my name is Timeladi Adelako, an ISOC Youth Ambassador and also a product marketer at Google. Just like Anna mentioned, I'll be wearing two hats today. One as a global youth ambassador and also an African youth. Um, I would start with the first question and because I've, I'm here to actually advocate for a more inclusive and youth-centered approach in the World Summit on Information Society WISIS. I say unequivocally that the youth of today are deeply connected to the digital world through the use of platforms such as media, digital payment platforms, tech hubs and incubators, and even entrepreneurship, just to mention a few. This connection actually tells just one story, that African youth recognize the immense potential of ICT. In spite of our deep connection to ICT, we have a desire we want a stronger representative in policies that actually influence the development and use of these technologies. Um, I want to quote a statistics that I believe that we are familiar with, but I will just quote again. Actually, 70% of Sub-Saharan African are under 30, and by 2030, young Africans are expected to constitute about 42% of global youth. Needless to say that it's due time that we, African youth, have a seat at table where decisions about high city regulations and developments are made. African youth like Inyaboyeji, Prosper Otemuiwa from Nigeria, Kamal Yakub from Ghana, Kenyan data scientist Charity Wayua, who leads IBM Research in Africa, have all been known to influence and profile data-driven innovation to lead change in ICT. But we can be more and that's part of these recommendations. To continually shape ICT systems and be global shakers that we are, we call for greater inclusivity of youth representatives in the WISIS process. We urge stakeholders to provide financial support and create tailored development opportunities for us to share our innovative insights and address concerns such as data privacy in ICT, as mentioned by one of the previous speakers. Furthermore, we want WISIS process to focus on initiatives that improve access to education and also to empower us to actively represent in social and economic programs that influence technology in our respective countries across the continent. ICT can be a force for radical change. I'm very sure we are all aware of this. And it's opening doors to education, healthcare access, international partnerships for Africa and even beyond. I have a strong conviction that the WISIS process holds immense potential to be a powerful force for change and solution in Africa and the world. It's a platform where we can utilize and work collaboratively to develop targeted solutions and ensure that ICT contribute to sustainable development and benefits all of humanity with a special focus on African youth. To also talk about the other question on ongoing trends and emerging technologies, particularly AI, and how they impact uh, or in that the realization of WISIS vision. I would like to say that AI actually holds immense potential for advancing human development and sustainable development goals. AI can enhance education and healthcare access, it can influence job creation, it can curtail global issues like climate change and even poverty. Also, AI can pave the way for a more inclusive and people-centered information society by improving accessibility for persons living with disability, even through assistive technologies, including screen readers and text-to-speech software, which I know we are all aware of. Furthermore, AI paves a pivotal role in providing essential services, such as healthcare, education, and government services. It contributes to the diagnostic of 
treatment of diseases and even delivery of educational resources to remote areas. And during COVID, we saw how AI was very useful in some of the initiatives that were brought about. However, AI also presents potential threats in the form of data privacy to the WISIS vision, including the creation of surveillance systems and new forms of discrimination and exclusion. It is imperative to ensure that AI is developed and employed in a manner that upholds human rights and aligns with the WISIS objectives. The impact of AI on human development, SDGs, and WISIS vision hinges on responsible development and utilization. To achieve this, it is essential that we invest in research and understand AI's ethical and social implications. It's important that we also establish international standards and guidelines for its development and use to foster transparency, accountability, and even to even educate the public about AI's potential benefits and risk, and to teach individuals to have control over their own data and usage. In closing, I want to reiterate that the time is now. Together, we can ensure that the WISIS process truly reflects the aspirations and concerns of youth globally and even in Africa. And in doing so, we can pave the way for a brighter and more inclusive digital future. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Temelat. And uh, now we are almost uh, opening the roundtable discussion. Uh, but before that, uh, I will give the floor to our co-partners, uh, ITU, uh, UNESCO, and uh, UNDEP. So I, I would like to, to give two minutes to each. Um, so uh, uh, Ms. Gitanjali Sa, a, a Strategy and Policy Coordinator from ITU, uh, if you could be so kind and as co-partner of this event, two minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you for your vision and also Shamika, the CSTD Secretariat, for ensuring that it's a joint process and that we are all working together on it. Uh, as uh, we have been, uh, you know, discussing all throughout that we have limited resources and capacities, so uh, the UN, ITU, UNESCO, UNDP, UNCTAD, CSTD, we are all joining hands to work on this process. Um, well, um, WISIS actually set the foundations of, uh, of digital cooperation right in 2003. Uh, the multi-stakeholder principles which we are adhering to even now, uh, inclusion, and in terms of what we have achieved, um, we have achieved a lot in terms of digital cooperation at least, uh, you know, looking at how the UN has been working together and how we've been aligning with the different UN processes. Uh, for example, those of you who are who are involved in the WISIS uh, forum, the WISIS special initiatives, the WISIS prizes. Uh, we've been aligning them with the decade of indigenous languages, with uh, UNESCO, uh, Pratik will talk about it later, with WHO, the decade of aging, healthy aging. Um, we've been trying to promote the role of digital in healthy aging. Uh, and so many other uh, uh, UN processes like the HLPF, uh, we have been asked to align the uh, WISIS action lines uh, with the 2030 uh, agenda for sustainable development, highlighting the role of digital in achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, ITU and UNDP recently did a very successful SDG Digital, uh, where we again highlighted the importance of digital preceding the uh, UN General Assembly. Uh, so there are uh, great examples of uh, what the UN has been doing uh, in collaboration, not only with each other, but also with all the stakeholders. Uh, the WISIS prizes is such a great example. I see so many uh, prize winners here uh, where we've been able to give them international recognition and uh, elevate their, uh, their projects. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, so many of you. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, some of the things that we need to pay attention on is, uh, you will recall, so Anred, like you. Oh, I think that you achieve your two minutes. Sure, <laughs> okay, just Sorry. wrapping up. <laughs> just, just four things uh, to highlight. Uh, you know, uh, some of the things we need to pay attention on is the targets. Uh, we do remember that we had the WISIS targets, which we uh, probably should look at again. Um, and also um, connecting it to new things like the uh, UN High Impact Initiatives, the DPI, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, so now I will give the floor to Mr. Cedric uh, Vashholtz, 
uh, Chief uh, Digital Policies and Digital Transformation Section at UNESCO. Thank you, Chair. Two so minutes. It's, it's not Cedric, it's Pratik Sivil. I'm a program specialist uh, at UNESCO and will okay. speak on behalf of UNESCO today. Okay. Thanks to the Secretariat and CSTD for having us here. Uh, I would echo Gitanjali's remarks in terms of multi-stakeholderism and cooperation across UN agencies forming the basis of our work. We've been very closely cooperating with UNDP, ITU, uh, UNCTAD as part of the UNGIS, but uh, I would now really focus more on some of the thematic achievements uh, and challenges. And uh, UNESCO has been co-facilitating leading uh, about six action lines. and. Uh, on access to information, I would like to share between 2016 and 2023, there have been about 1,200 internet shutdowns globally. And this remains a major challenge. And UNESCO has been working on assessing internet environments based on a rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder approach in about 45 countries. And this work will need to be strengthened also with the support of civil society, academia, and the private sector. Uh, we've been able to have access to Information Day, which is celebrated on 28th of September, uh, which is a great moment for advocacy on open access to information in governments as well. And uh, as Gitanjali mentioned, uh, there is a dimension of the, the decade of indigenous languages. So inclusion forms an important part of the work that the UN as a whole uh, is doing here. Uh, Media and information literacy remains a major challenge uh, when we are talking about disinformation, misinformation, and in this domain, we have strengthened our programs also, including uh, youth, uh, building dynamic coalitions on media and information literacy to involve different actors and promote different kinds of responses, whether it comes to fact-checking or uh, supporting civil society organizations uh, in upscaling. Uh, I will speak briefly about e-science. Uh, so we have several standard set. I'll just stop soon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just several standard setting instruments which are really br bringing global communities together, which is uh, the recommendation on open science, the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, uh, and the recommendation on open educational resources have become uh, central tools which are being uh, mobilized to build communities globally. So. Uh, looking forward to the input and the feed feedback over here, and we continue to remain engaged with the business process and with our partners here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So now, uh, uh, Mr. Robert Opp, Chief Digital Officer at UNDP. Hello, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I don't plan to take two minutes. Um, we're here to listen uh, and I think it's the, the issues that are coming up already are uh, extremely relevant and it's great to hear um, the themes that are emerging. I think um, if I think back 20 years ago and think of what's changed, I think probably for the people in this room and those who were involved, uh, the ICT or the ICT for Development was, would be considered quite important. But I think today you cannot deny that it is an absolute megatrend driving global change and issues worldwide um, in the order of climate change, which has also become uh, a super megatrend. And I think that that means that the urgency is greater than ever. And we've done a lot in the last 20 years, but the pace of change is accelerating. And so that's when we look forward to WISIS Plus 20 and working together with our UN partners and all of the multi-stakeholder groups, this is what we need to keep in mind, that it's an urgent situation. So I will leave it there, and thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So now I will um, open uh, for our freestyle uh, roundtable discussion after uh, thanking to all the discussion starters. Yes, so now uh, we have to manage uh, all uh, the people that are going to intervene. Um, so I think, uh, sir, you were first, then we have you, and 
three. So then uh, uh, European Commission on behalf of the European Union and then Cuba. So please, who can help me? Li Ping, can you help me? Looking around. <laughs> So we have already, so I have uh, four in my mind here and not in the ear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Anna. I'm Peter Brook. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Award. We uh, have so started you have three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have started in 2003 to focus on the best practice in content in, uh, with the ICT. It's an Austrian member state initiative, which we have run now for the last 20 years, every year. We have had uh, 12,800 participants, uh, 1,600 winners, according to the action lines uh, C7 uh, from uh, the VISIS uh, plan of action. I think that the review is a very difficult exercise. And I'm saying this very clearly because I think that VISIS and the VISIS process has lost half of its focus. The first focus is on digital divide and digital inclusion. I think Annette was speaking about this and also a friend from Indi India was speaking about it. But the other side was and is still the question of the transformation into the knowledge society. And I would say that we have technology success but knowledge failure. And if you are looking at disinformation, misinformation, hate speech, uh, fake news, and things like this. These are issues which we need to take seriously. That's the first point. The second point is, this is, is pre-sustainable development goals. It is millennium development goals. And the difference between the millennium development goals and the sustainable development goals is that in sustainable development goals we have 176 indicators which give us actually KPIs of what we have achieved. The Tunis plan of action does not have KPIs. And therefore we have a real issue in terms of the review and the review will be uh, moving back and forth and so on. The last thing is which I want to stress is we have in the Tunis <laughs> plan of action a line which many people have not known. It's C9 and that is media. And the media is a completely different kind of landscape today due to the economics of digital platform monopolization. We have this year for the first time in human history, or uh, talking about the Gutenberg moment, is 54% of global advertising revenues goes to five American companies. And it means that digital publishing, I'm talking about community publishing in Canada, 567 papers have been closed in the last two months. So if you're thinking about media diversity and things like this, then you're just really looking at something where we are really having a loss of all those intermediaries which we have called editorial added value. And that needs to be front and centered in the review and I'm offering the World Summit Award and the International Center of New Media and its partners in 182 countries as a partner also in this exercise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you will be able to, uh, to respond to the questionnaire uh, uh, in written form um, as uh, uh, everything that you said is um, very important, uh, as everybody is, that is... Uh, talking here, but uh, responding to the questionnaire will be very, very important. Now I'll give the floor to Bangladesh. Ba Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, when I entered the WSIS era, that time I was the youth ambassador of the WSIS. Now I am former youth. <laughs> okay. I asked my uh, CSTD secretariat to share what does Bangladesh expect from the future WSIS. I'm so grateful uh, for giving me the opportunity. Bangladesh government, uh, Bangladesh is the very unique country regarding implementation the WSIS action line. Bangladesh government formed Bangladesh working group on WSIS with a multi-stakeholder. And uh, uh, I am one of the proud member of the Bangladesh working group on WSIS. After summit, uh, C1 to C11, 
Bangladesh government has integrated with the five-year plan as well as CSO community also integrated C1 to C11 of their annual uh, plan. Thirdly, as a result, Bangladesh government and CSO combinedly technical community received lots of WSIS uh, prize as a winner, as a champion also. Fourth, CSO and Bangladesh government has successfully addressed the COVID-19 operation uh, disaster through ICT application that is called C7 ICT application and uh, as WSIS outcome Bangladesh has been organizing the Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum this is the national internet governance forum with a multi-stakeholderism Madam Chair we expect from the future of WSIS Bangladesh government has already declared the smart Bangladesh in line with the digital Bangladesh there are four areas, assuming sustainable economic growth, reducing poverty, ensure social and justice, and third one is the very important, creating a digital and knowledge-based society. Madam Sir, through four areas, one is the smart citizen, another one is the smart society, another one is smart economy, and as well as smart government. In conclusion, we need a WSIS forum regularly. It is really multi-stakeholderism. Second, now we are preparing for participation in the WSIS Forum 2024, including member of the parliament as well as the mayor of the municipal corporation promoting local governance. Third, we would appreciate it if the WSIS secretariat uh, would publish a handbook for the parliamentarian and uh, as well as the mayor like IGF secretariat. It would, it would be very useful. Fourth, Summit of the PUSR and GDC process can learn from the WSIS and as well as IGF Secretariat what is multi-stakeholderism. Thank you, madam. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now I think it's the time to give the floor to Cuba and then European Commission. Thank you, Chair, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. On December 12, 2003, the first phase of the World Summit on the Information Society ended with the adoption of its final documents by the head of, of state and government of 175 countries. After arduous discussions, the developing countries succeeded in having the so-called digital divide recognized as a dimension of the existing economic and social divisions and allowed, allowed this topic to move out of the technical debate at the expert level and become a political issue of concern to the international community. 20 years later, it has been demonstrated without a doubt that the information and communication technologies in general and the internet in particular are essential tools for the development of the countries. But it has also been confirmed that this beneficial impact of ICTs and the internet is significantly lower in developing countries compared to developed countries. The unfulfillment of many of the WISIS agreements has had a negative impact on developing countries. For example, financial mechanisms to address the challenges of using ICT for development has not been established. In addition, persist the application of unilateral measures not in accordance with international law and the Charter of the United Nations that impedes the full achievement of economic and social development of the affected countries. Madam Chair, dear colleagues, all these issues were addressed with concern by numerous head of state and government at the G77 and China summit held in Havana, Cuba last September and whose central theme was current development challenges, the role of science, technology, and innovation. The final declaration of this summit reaffirmed the 2005 Tunis Agenda for the Information Society, stating that the G77 and China promote a close alignment between the World Summit of Information Society process and the 2030 uh, agenda for Sustainable Development. It also called for a close correspondence of the WISIS process with the Addis Ababa Action Agenda 
and other outcomes of relevant intergovernmental processes, including the Global Digital Compact and the Summit of the Future. It was further agreed to work towards a strong and concerted position of the G77 and China to ensure that the WCIS Plus 20 general review process, the Global Digital Compact, and the Summit of the Future contribute to inter alia the achievement of sustainable, sustainable development and closing the digi digital divide between developed and developing countries. It was reiterated uh, that think the Tunis Agenda and the Geneva now. Declaration of Principles and Plan of Action shall lay down the guiding principles for digital cooperation. Madam Chair, dear colleague, you the are declaration, finishing, right? I am finishing. The Declaration of Principles of the first phase of WISIS, entitled Building the Information Society, a Global Challenge for the New Millennium, establish a common view of the information society, which among other attributes should be people-centered, inclusive, and develop-oriented. In addition, the declaration noted... Okay, I think that your main message was already conveyed. No, I will no? just finish by saying that it's, it's, up to, it's up to us now to finally make a reality of that common vision okay. that was envisioned 20 years ago. Thank you. Muitas gracias. Very well, thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to uh, Mr. Pierce Odon Odon uh, Odonohu, uh, who is going to speak on behalf of the European Union. Thank you. Yes, I'm speaking on behalf of the European Union and its member states. We welcome the opportunity to share lessons learned from the WISIS implementation process at this crucial moment in the history of the Internet. We cannot appreciate the Internet's unprecedented success without recognizing the vital role of the WISIS and the multi-stakeholder model it has advocated. The European Union continues to support the principles set out in the Geneva Action Plan and the Tunis Agenda. But our efforts do not end here. The multi-stakeholder model is not flawless, but it is still our most reliable instrument for effective internet governance and the foundation for a dynamic system involving all stakeholders in the running of the internet. We shall make every effort to ensure that it will never be replaced. The IGF is living proof that this cooperative approach works its value stems from adopting a vibrant multi-stakeholder approach and ensuring that voices from governments to private sector, civil society, the technical community and academia are heard and engage in pivotal discussions on the Internet's future and governance. The EU strongly supports a proactive and ambitious approach towards keeping human rights as the foundation of an open, free and secure online space based on human-centric digitalization preserving human dignity and the equality of all people without discrimination of any kind, online and offline. We welcome the setting up of the uh, UN Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Board on Artificial Intelligence. The EU uh, AI Act, which puts the impact of artificial intelligence technologies to the center, may serve as a model for regulation elsewhere. But as we approach WISIS Plus 20, we have a golden opportunity to bolster this framework and to reinforce our foundational multi-stakeholder principles. Establishing centralized control over the internet and its governance system is not an option. Our focus should be, on the contrary, to keep its openness and freedom. This vision aligns with the SDGs. As the EU highlighted in its recent statement on the UN Global Digital Compact, swifter progress on the SDGs goes hand in hand with our commitment to a more inclusive, digital future and to bridging the digital divides. In this regard, the EU and its member states are working hard through the Global Gateway as Team Europe to deploy digital networks and infrastructures worldwide, prioritizing underserved regions, countries and populations. In pursuing this digital future, it is critical that the IGF strengthens its role in fostering an inclusive, open and sustainable digital environment and involves into an even more impactful and inclusive model. This is a shortened version of our statement, you'll be glad to know, <laughs> and the full version will be made available shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
And now I will give the floor to the behind, behind you, behind, Madam Chair. Behind. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, colleagues here. My name is Atisha Banaka. I'm a senior advisor on G uh, digital transformations at uh, Japan International Cooperation Agencies. But I'm actually wanted to make a questions to you, as an individual who has, in, you know, intimately involved in the WISIS process, and where, like, you know, especially in the financial mechanism part. I used to be working in the UNDP. Now, three weeks ago, I was at uh, digital, sorry, yes, the digital summit, and it struck me. So, like, fundamental questions that we have actually asked 20 years ago remain the same. Fundamental things such as digital inclusions, financial mechanisms, all these things actually remain the same. And I, it struck me saying, I should have worked harder, perhaps. In 20 years, I should actually have worked harder so I can make a difference and then solve some of these fundamental challenges. Now, we are at the verge, as Robert Ops said, of digital technology, which is like a fad, right? It was like ICT for developers fad at the business process. And then remember what happened after 2005. Everybody who actually went out, I said, like, sorry, we had enough of this. The development partners, they left, you know, they left and even developing countries who are really excited about this, they left. So my, find, my questions to you is, what can we do, you know, how can we do something different this time? Because these two years are gonna be critical. You know, we're gonna have the, the summit for the future summit next year. We're gonna have digital compact. We're gonna have WCS plus 20 in 2025. If we cannot make a difference this time, I believe that we're gonna have the same failure we saw from 2005 to, to around 2012. This seven years of dark age of digital development. So I, I urge you, all of you, can we actually come up with a real concrete solutions and then something that we can make a difference, say yes, digital technology and then ICT can actually work for everybody to create the information society and also for the development of developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, please. Oh my God, Ponslet, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ponslet from the Gambia NRI. I just want us to go back and look at um, why there are big disparities as we look into the WSIS Plus 20. You discover that it's um, good when we have all oh, the UNDP, the ITU, UNESCO, they claim they work together at the top level. If you go down to the bottom level, there's no cooperation at country level. And that is why we are still dealing with big gaps in the digital divide. And the NRIs are, are now well strengthened that they can help all these um, big international agencies on the ground. And I will suggest that moving forward, you have to work with the NRIs because the governments too are part of that process. A good example I will stop at, I'm recently doing the um, UNESCO IUI, Internet Universal Indicators, as a lead researcher in, in the Gambia. UNDP are not involved. When I contacted them, they didn't know about the Romex, UNDP country office. So how do you filter down information? And we have to really look at that seriously. It's good folks here yes, sit from New York or Geneva and say, blah, 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 we work together on the ground level. Do you really work together? Thank you. Thank you very much, Monslet. Now, please. My name is Izumi Ais. I am living in Japan. I used to be participating in all the prep processes of the WISIS. And I do agree with what my friend, colleague Atsushi said. Have we done our homework? Uh, we used to have much more dissenting voices to hear uh, from the East and South. Where's China now here? Iran, India, Russia, South Africa. I don't see them. In the very beginning, we have heated a debate about who's going to speak this or that, and a lot of rules but substances and many of which the civil society like us didn't really agree with. But it was a very interesting creative processes that we tried to listen to each other. And I feel like it's gone. I might be naive, but this was proposed right after the 9-11 processes. 
there were big fears from the South that the digital you know, development will leave them out, the digital divide. But even you know, the countries like the US or Japan and others who have the monies wanted to let them come in together discuss. That, to me, was the genesis of the resist. Where is it? I was invited to the China's Inter World Internet Conference, Digital Dialogue on, no, Dialogue on Digital Civilization in June this year. Oh, yeah. I was the only Japanese. There are only 19 participants from overseas. You can blame China, not inviting them, but that's, that's not the way. Uh, there will be another World Internet Conference next month. Let's see how many will join together. Um, also, today, we heard what's going on in Israel and Palestine. Nobody really in this room tried to address that. Does it relate to ICT? Of course. How about the things going on in Eastern Russia or Russian side? We carefully avoided these hot potatoes, perhaps. But I feel like the ICT is very powerless and talking about the SDGs and human rights. Also, how about the, the status of women in certain countries? It went worse than 20 years ago, mm -hmm. as we all know. So how much ICT could play? How much we have done? Of course, there are areas that they played a very good job. But we cannot just remain optimistic and ask AI for you know, rescue or whatever. So the multi-stakeholder approach and the human-centric approach, is, I agree with Anietta. Yes, it was a great result of our Europe blood, sweat, and tears of many days in Geneva and the other way. So the multi-stakeholder was not given. It will erode if you don't do more. How about the climate change? We had a worse summer in Japan and many others. How can technologies do while consuming a lot of servers and energies on the AI? They might be regulated. So I'd like to really, all of you, me, address these real difficult issues and just don't resort to the you know, friendly, nice, warm environment that Kyoto presents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to Peter Meyer, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to react. Uh, I didn't intend to react directly, uh, indirectly, but anyway. So multi-stakeholderism. I think in this environment and in this CSTV open forum, we can be proud. We can be proud because we were one of the first ones who implemented or tried to introduce the uh, multi-stakeholder approach in our work, in the working groups. It wasn't simple. Uh, in the first working group, it was very controversial. In the second working group, it was smooth. So, first, I'm proud of it. And on, on, on behalf of the CSTD, I think we can be proud of that. So probably this is the way to go forward, not only in the CSTD, but the whole UN. That's for one. Hot potato. Uh, we are in the setting of the IGF. The IGF, we may think, is very relevant. That's what we think. Do other stakeholders think the same way? Do governments think the same way? I'm afraid not. And why? Because we have the IGF with its outcomes, and it is mandated to have outcomes, but it's also mandated not to have resolutions. So if there is no resolution in the UN, you don't exist. So how, how can we bridge this gap? CSTD is mandated to review the processes within the UN system. IGF is part of the UN system. IGF Secretariat regularly gives report to the CSTD. We listen to that. And we write one sentence, IGF Secretariat gave the report. We don't know about the content. We don't know about any recommendations. We don't follow up. And that is the key. We should follow up. We should have in the resolution the key messages. We should have, if not in the resolution, because it is a very hot debate all the time, I have the experience. 
but we can manage. We can manage to have it in the resolution, we can manage to have it in the annex of the CHAS report, but we can, we should forward it to the ECOSOC and through ECOSOC to the uh, UN General Assembly in order that all stakeholders, that is all member states, will be aware that we are doing something which is relevant, which is relevant not only in the field of ICTs, but which is relevant for the Sustainable <coughs> Development Goals. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Peter, uh, very much. Um, I just would like to emphasize that uh, it's a pity that uh, some of the governments that uh, make our lives sometimes very difficult uh, in our discussions at the CSCD, they, they are not here, so they cannot well, hear. No, but Kubi is here yet. Nigel. He's leaving. <laughs> Nigel, Nigel. Nigel. Uh, who asked uh, f first? I don't know. Um, I thought, please, sir, go ahead, and then Nigel. Introduce, introduce yourself. Hello, introduce I, yourself, uh, please. My name is Dinesh. I come from near Bangalore in a rural area where we have a community network. And our main activity is research on how to include low literate people as first class citizens of the internet. That's one thing that I think there are more than three billion people who come under this, and I don't see that we are focusing on them. Okay, we find internet access, but not what does it mean for low literacy? That means that if you can't know, if you don't know how to read or write, what is internet for you? What is Google for you? Can you do keywords? What is the results for you? What can you do with it? Think like that. There are too many people we just don't want to see or not willing to think that there is something we can do about it. And it's time we have technical people from the ground who are interested in addressing this issue and get them together and see what can be done about bringing internet as a first class uh, available thing for low literate people. Thank you very much, Nigel. UK, please. I'll sit next to you, yeah. God, I'm exhausted after that. No, uh, uh, sorry, Nigel Hickson, uh, uh, Department of uh, Science, Innovation, and Technology for the UK. And really, I just wanted to say about three things. I think first, it's really excellent to have this debate here. I mean, if we can't have a thorough, controversial, open and constructive debate about the WISIS process at the IGF, then we can't have it anywhere. So it's really excellent to, to have it here. Secondly, I listened to Pierce O'Donoghue speak, and I thought, well, he's speaking for the whole of the European Union, so I needn't say anything. And then I forgot that we're not in the European <laughs> Union. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm going to the end of my career so I can say things like that. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I wanted to you know, completely endorse uh, what, 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 what he said. I think it's just so important that we have these discussions. And I think it's so important that we also recognize where we have come from. And we all re also, we recognize what's happened since 2005, not just in terms of technology, which we all understand and many of us have experienced here, but we also recognize the work that's taken place in the UN CSDD, in the reports that have been written, in the WISIS forum where we've had excellent discussions year after year on many issues, the work that UNESCO has done as well, and many other regional UN bodies and other bodies. There hasn't been silence since 2004. There's been evolution. There's been evolution across the spectrum. There's been evolution at ICANN. There's been evolution at IGF. There's been evolution in UNCSTD. We have moved forward. Yes, and of course it's not perfect. And that's why it was so wise at Tunis that the language in the Tunis agenda said, yeah, you ought to review it. We ought to review it. We reviewed it after 10 years and we ought to review it again. I mean, let's lift the drain covers up. 
Let's lift those covers up, as other people have said, and review it. But let's not forgotten where we've come from and the progress we've made. And let's not forget either of why we got together in Geneva and Tunis. It wasn't to discuss internet governance as such. It wasn't to discuss the mechanisms of the internet, but there's no harm in discussing that. It was to do better than that. It was to connect people. It was to discuss why we have disparities, regional disparities. And as we heard from the UT ITU Secretary General at the beginning of this conference, and we heard from many other people, we still have those issues. So let's focus. Let's focus on development. Let's focus on sustainability. Let's focus on what really matters. Thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, with uh, Nigel uh, Hickinson from UK, I think that we come to an end uh, of uh, this um, uh, first uh, open consultation. Um, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for your active and valuable participation throughout this uh, session. Uh, your uh, uh, contributions have greatly enriched our discussions. Don't forget the questionnaire, please. Uh, fulfill this questionnaire that, of course, it's not he here in paper. It is in the virtual world, is in the website of CSTD. It will be in the session, in the, in the website of the IGF uh, in this uh, session, and it will be spread widely. And it will be very important uh, to have your inputs in a written form. And with that, I declare the first open consultation closed. If we will be in the UN, I will have a hammer. So as I don't have a hammer, I will this bottle of water. <laughs>